Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. If you really care about putting patients before religion, you should care about reproductive justice. Uh, my name is Yumhi Park and I'm the Engagement and Mobilization Manager at the National Women's Law Center. We have a few technical notes before we begin. First, all lines will be on mute during today's webinar. Second, we'll be taking questions after our experts are finished with the presentation, but we encourage you to submit questions throughout the webinar. And you can do that by typing it using the chat function. Finally, this webinar will be recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording of the presentation as well as a link to the slides within the next few days. At this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to Kelly Garcia, Director of Reproductive Justice Initiatives and Senior Counsel at the National Women's Law Center. Hi, Yamhi. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. We're very excited to have everyone here for our first um, webinar of this year's If You Really Care About series. Before we get started, I want to turn it over to Lena Houston of If When How to talk about to talk about If When How and then um I'm going to, and she's going to kick it back to me, and I'll give a quick overview of our upcoming webinars, what we're expecting, and the we talk about reproductive justice movement generally, as well as an introduction to today's terrific webinar. Lena? Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Lena Houston, and I'm the Director of Campus and Community Programs at the National Office of If, When, How. As Kelly says, this is the first webinar in our eighth annual series. We're very excited to be working together again, and we're very, very excited that you have joined us today. We have two more webinars scheduled this fall, one on immigration and reproductive justice, and one on environmental justice and reproductive justice. So if you haven't already registered for those, we hope that you will. In case this is the first time you're tuning into this webinar series, or if you may not be familiar with If, When, How, we are a national nonprofit that trains, networks, and mobilizes law students and legal professionals to work within and beyond the legal system to champion reproductive justice. We work with chapters on law school campuses across the country, our incredible reproductive justice fellows in Washington, DC, state fellows in Seattle and Pittsburgh, and HIV fellows in Atlanta and Oakland, and a robust community of alums and legal professionals. If When How believes that achieving reproductive justice will take thoughtful action and strategic activism, acknowledging the intersection of identities, collaborating across disciplines, and working toward a critical transformation of the current legal system, because ensuring that all people have the right to decide if, when, and how to create families depends entirely on if, when, and how hard we fight. On behalf of If, When, How, I want to give a big thank you to the National Women's Law Center, particularly to Kelly and Yumhi, as well as to our esteemed presenters for bringing their expertise to this webinar. So thank you again for being here and for your interest in reproductive justice. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Lena, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to ask this really quickly to make sure that my screen is sharing and you're seeing the right screen. Okay, great. Um, so I want to take a minute to talk a little bit about this webinar series for those of you who are new to, um, to this program, which we've been doing with If, When, How uh, for many years. And the series was really developed several years ago to address the intersection between reproductive justice and other progressive issues. So the goal of the series is really to elucidate the link between reproductive justice and other reproductive justice issues and to help bring on board to reproductive justice people who are working on other issues. Um, the goal, the original webinar series was really focused largely towards law students, but it has evolved over the past several years to um, be much broader and try to incorporate a whole host of advocates, no matter where you are in thinking about reproductive justice, and hopefully give us the opportunity to really bring new advocates to the reproductive justice community. And we really want 
to use these webinars as an opportunity to highlight the social justice and human rights underpinnings of progressive work and the ways in which we are all working towards common goals, which I think um, this year is taking on new and increased urgency. So before I move on to before before I move on to introducing um, today's specific webinar series and our wonderful speakers, I want to talk a little bit about the reproductive justice movement more broadly. So the reproductive justice movement was really a response to the fact that women of color, low-income women, and younger women are as likely, if not more likely, to face resistance to their childbearing and child-rearing as they are to have trouble accessing contraception and abortion. So it was created as a response to movements that had failed to meet the needs of communities of color. And it, recognizes that multiple forms of social oppression and discrimination keep individuals being, from being able to have and raise the families um, that they want. And it also importantly recognizes that full reproductive freedom requires addressing all forms of inequality. And at the center of the reproductive justice movement is a real recognition of intersectionality, a recognition of the ways in which our uh, multiple forms of oppression and multiple forms of discrimination intersect and affect women's lives differently depending on where they are situated. And the need for us to call upon broad ranges of, of social justice movements in order to affect reproductive justice. So quickly, I just want to talk about the components of reproductive justice. And this uh, relies on the on on Sister Song, the original kind of development of thinking about reproductive justice, which is the idea that it represents and it's important to recognize the right of individuals to have the children they want, raise the children they have, and plan their families through safe legal access to abortion and contraception. And so the reproductive justice movement relates to social justice movements by because it requires that all people have the resources as well as the economic, social, and political power to make decisions about their bodies, sexuality, and reproduction with self-determination and dignity. So it's not just about the question of whether or not you have access to contraception and abortion and can use contraception and abortion, but whether are the full, you have the full range of political and economic resources and able to, in, in order to be able to make decisions about your family and your bodies with that self-determination and dignity. And it's important to note that, the, that reproductive justice recognizes the important role that government plays in remedying social inequalities that contribute to reproductive oppression. So it calls upon the government to be an active participant in remedying and ending ending all forms of oppression that harm reproductive oppression. And so with that context in mind, I wanna move in to today's webinar, which is about putting patients first. And so we want to recognize that when we have refusals to provide care, that places religious beliefs over patients' needs. And religious refusals, which um, Janelle George, I think, is going to do a nice introduction of, but when people, ref when providers are able to refuse to provide care, that harms patients' needs. It keeps women from being able to get the health care that they need. And when that happens, that, that the effects of these refusals 
disproportionately falls upon communities that are already having problems accessing health care. And so there's a real overlap there between the goals of reproductive justice and the need to ensure that people can access the health care and not be denied access to health care because of a provider's religious um, belief. And so with that, I'm going to turn, um, introduce you know, to our today's speakers and then turn it over to our first speaker. So today we have Janelle George, um, who is the Director of Federal Reproductive Rights and Health and Senior Counsel here at the National Women's Law Center. And she is going to be speaking first. And then she's gonna turn it over to Kira Shepard, who is Director of Racial Justice, Public Rights, Private Conscience Project um, the center, at the Center on Gender and Sexuality Law at Columbia Law School. Janelle, take it away. Thanks so much for that introduction, Kelly. And I'm just holding for the slides to come up. There we are. Thank you so much again. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, the National Women's Law Center has worked for over 45 years to protect and advance the lives of women in core areas of their lives, including education, the workplace, uh, as well as healthcare, their reproductive lives, with a particular focus on the needs of low-income women. So it's with this lens that we approach this work looking at these issues through all of these different experiences and perspectives. So we consider economic equality, racial justice when we are examining these issues. And for decades, the Law Center has actually worked on this issue that's the subject of our webinar today, uh, religious refusals and religious exemption laws. Uh, and we've worked in a variety of ways. We've addressed hospital mergers. You'll see increasingly, um, uh, religiously affiliated institutions are merging with other institutions, uh, particularly in certain states. Uh, we worked on public education, supporting community developed and community based solutions for addressing religious refusals. And we've also worked on amplifying community voices, providing technical assistance as needed, producing materials. We've worked with state advocates on addressing pharmacy refusals. We've worked on ensuring access to birth control. And we are waiting with bated breath for any day for the administration to issue a rule related to the Affordable Care Act's birth control uh, benefit uh, that provides women with no cost access to uh, birth control. So we are continuing that work. And again, that rule could come down any day, so we are definitely uh, keeping an eye out on that. And we also work with allies, like many of you who are joining us on the webinar today, to address harmful legislative proposals. And we see a lot of these proposals in the form of uh, what we call must-pass legislation, annual funding bills on the federal level. So it was uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her uh, dissent to the Hobby Lobby case, uh, who said, I think very uh, prophetically in some ways, <laughs> she said, the court, I fear, has ventured into a minefield. And for those who are not familiar with the Hobby Lobby case, it involved an employer uh, who objected to providing employees with access to, with insurance coverage, particularly for contraception. And this minefield that RBG was referring to is in fact what we are calling religious exemption. Also, we've referred to as religious refusal laws. And so we see these provisions, these state and federal provisions uh, that allow health providers, clinics, employers, schools, and health insurance plans to refuse to provide 
cover, pay for, and we'll talk about even referring or providing information about health services. And these services can include transition-related services, abortion or contraception, a variety of services, and these refusals all appear under the guise of what we call religious liberty, liberty, or that term that has been used over and over again, religious liberty. And even though we're using the terms religion, I do want to uh, emphasize that we are um, also talking about moral objections as well. Uh, and so, uh, we know that these attempts to undermine hard-won rights through the guise of religion have been targeted at a variety of individuals, including LGBTQ individuals, unmarried individuals, women, and others. Uh, and we also know that a provider's religious beliefs should never determine the care that a patient receives. Uh, and so what we see are refusals uh, both at the individual and institutional level uh, to provide specific aspects of health care due to religious, moral, or ethical beliefs, and again, moral as well as religious. Uh, and we see these repeatedly, and I'll, I'll share some stories that we have heard about, about these kind of refusals. Uh, and it's interesting, particularly uh, when we talk about reproductive health, because the leading organization for providers of reproductive health, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or ACOG, has opined that a religious exemption should be accommodated only if the primary duty to the patient can be fulfilled. And this duty encompasses providing medically indicated and requested care regardless of the provider's personal moral objections. So it's interesting that we see the provider group coming out with that strong statement, yet still we see the spread of these religious refusals. Uh, one example on the federal level of a religious uh, exemption in, in federal law is the 1973 Church Amendment. Now, this amendment explicitly exempts private hospitals receiving federal funds from providing abortion uh, based on religious beliefs or moral convictions. And one thing that's important to note, especially as you will hear a lot of the political rhetoric surrounding these provisions, is there is no federal law that requires hospitals to provide abortion services. We know there are limited circumstances, rape, incest, uh, or life endangerment, but a lot of times you'll hear in the, the rhetoric that providers are being forced. There is no law requiring the provision. So let's talk about some of the examples of harm to patients when they refuse care based on uh, religious beliefs. And I think that this is what I hope that folks take away from this is there is real harm and there are real people behind these political debates about exemptions and refusals. Real people's lives are being threatened and lives are being lost as a result. So one patient uh, was told by a provider that HIV positive patients were not welcomed after he disclosed his HIV status. And later when he returned uh, seeking treatment for chest pain, the doctor dismissed him, uh, dismissed him as overreacting to muscle cramps and recommended that he see a psychiatrist. Over the next week, he experienced seizures, but his doctor refused to authorize emergency treatment. Ultimately, police brought the patient to an emergency room. He was admitted to the hospital with gastrointestinal hemorrhaging and diagnosed with pneumonia, a staph infection, and AIDS. In another example, uh, at an infertility practice group, a patient uh, was subjected to a year of invasive tests and treatment. When it became clear that she needed in vitro fertilization to become pregnant, 
every doctor in the practice actually refused to treat her, claiming that their religious beliefs prevented them from performing the procedure for a lesbian. In another example, a patient at an urban Northeastern Catholic hospital experiencing a miscarriage nearly died because of the hospital's refusal to treat her. The patient's physician recalled that, in quotes, I quote, the woman was dying before our eyes, but the hospital's religious directives forbid appropriate treatment. And religious directives uh, are, uh, religious instructions, if you will, that outline the provision of care based on religious beliefs and principles uh, at these religious uh, facilities. This is really significant. So this patient was denied miscarriage uh, treatment. And it's significant because we know that nearly one in four women will experience a miscarriage in their lifetime, and they should not have to fear that they will be turned away uh, from providers. We also see these refusals in the context of pharmacies. Uh, individuals seeking birth control, for example, have been turned away at pharmacies. We know that in at least 25 states across the country, uh, women have experienced this kind of pharmacy, uh, these kind of pharmacy refusals. And this also includes rape survivors who are seeking time-sensitive emergency contraception to prevent pregnancy. And we know that the same pharmacies that refuse to dispense birth control also refuse to transfer a prescription or even refer patients to other pharmacies. Uh, some pharmacists have even berated or humiliated patients seeking birth control. And also pharmacies have refused to fill prescriptions for miscarriage management. Two Georgia women reported that their doctors prescribed medication to complete their miscarriages, but local pharmacies refused to fill their prescriptions because they considered this, medic uh, this miscarriage management medication to be abortion, which, by the way, we know is not true. Uh, one of the women stated that she ultimately decided to undergo a surgical procedure rather than face another pharmacy refusal. And we also see refusals to provide uh, even information uh, uh, information. Uh, and without complete information, patients might may not have an accurate understanding of their condition or even know the treatments to, that are available to them. And you all see the cartoon here. Uh, we do have to inject a little bit of humor here because uh, the harm that we're talking about is so serious. Uh, and significant for the patients who are experiencing it. But again, this poses serious uh, danger and without complete information, patients are not able to really fully access the care that they need. Uh, an example of lack of information or refusal to provide information, one OBGYN reported that the local Catholic bishop forbids their hospital from providing information to patients, even about nearby health centers that would provide birth control. Uh, patients who come to the hospital for family planning services do not receive any refer uh, referrals. And these, it's, it's really significant and troubling that these refusals violate patients' right to inform consent under both federal and state laws and leave them without the information they need to make healthcare uh, decisions for themselves. There's also refusals for insurance coverage of needed services. Some religiously affiliated health insurance plans exclude coverage. Again, we see for reproductive services, uh, and some employers refuse, as I mentioned for the Hobby Lobby case, to provide health insurance coverage for particular services. An example of this uh, is refusal by insurance companies to cover basic medical services for trans and gender non-conforming individuals. One insurance company refused to cover a transgender man's annual pelvic exam and pap smear, while another refused to pay for a fertility treatment for a transgender man's agenda because of a transgender man's gender identity. 
And let me discuss for a minute um, a provision that appears in one of the annual uh, spending bills that I mentioned before. These are annual, what are called appropriations bills. They lay out basically federal funding that is distributed to states for a variety of programs. One of the largest uh, programs is the Labor, Health, and Human Services uh, bill, uh, funding bill. So you're talking about funding for education, job training, uh, and a variety of sources. And included in that bill is a provision called the Weldon Amendment. This is what we call an appropriations rider. Again, it's just a provision that's attached to this annual must-pass bill. This, the Weldon Amendment has actually been included since 2005, and it creates a barrier to comprehensive health care. And as you can see um, from the slides, it allows healthcare entities, including hospitals, health insurance plans, and individuals, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, to refuse to provide abortion, cover it, pay for it, and as we have seen about information, even referring uh, folks to appropriate health centers where they can receive uh, that care. So again, what we see are on so many levels these kind of barriers. And what we also see, I mentioned earlier about religious directives, we see uh, Catholic hospitals, and I mentioned Catholic hospitals, not for any, I'm Catholic, <laughs> not for any uh, uh, singling out of Catholic hospitals, but because ha Catholic hospitals are, are one of the largest religiously affiliated health providers in the U.S. And again, they're governed by the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services. And what we see is these directives have been implemented to deny uh, patients who are experiencing ectopic pregnancies and miscarriage the treatment and information to which they are legally uh, entitled. And because they are such a large player, if you will, in our healthcare field, these refusals are really impactful for access uh, to care. Uh, in some hospitals and health providers has in, have interpreted the directive to prohibit prompt medically indicated treatment of miscarriage, uh, as I mentioned, and of course that places patient health in jeopardy and also delays access to really significant care. I do want to give a couple of examples of denial of care, and I know Kira, our next speaker, will also address uh, Catholic hospitals, but there was a woman outside of Chicago uh, who was experiencing pregnancy loss. She was denied care for 10 days at a Catholic hospital outside of Chicago. She had a fever of 106 degrees and was actually dying of sepsis when she was transferred to a hospital, finally, that would actually treat her. The treating physician noted that the woman was suffering from acute kidney injury requiring dialysis and a cognitive injury due to the severity of her sepsis. She spent nearly two weeks in the hospital and later had to be transferred to a long-term uh, care facility. And the tragedy here is that this could have been avoided. Uh, Tamisha Means, who, uh, whose name you have probably heard about, in the uh, media, but uh, she was sent home by a Catholic hospital with two Tylenol. After her water broke at 18 weeks of pregnancy, the hospital did not give her full information at her, about her condition and the treatment options. She returned to the hospital a couple of times, and the following day she was bleeding and in severe pain. Uh, the hospital only treated her when she actually began to deliver. So this is the price that patients are paying for these uh, refusals and exemptions. Uh, patients may never know why their treatment was delayed, why they were transferred, why they were denied care. Uh, and they might nev never even be informed, like Tamisha means, that they actually have additional treatment options. Uh, so the lack of notice, again, is another significant uh, uh, harm that's posed to patients. 
I mentioned that the law center works on uh, addressing mergers of Catholic hospitals. One thing about mergers is these have spread even to urgent care facilities. So you might uh, uh, access an urgent care facility and not even be aware that it is religiously affiliated. So that's something uh, that we're definitely keeping an eye out on and ensuring that folks just have noticed how widespread uh, these mergers actually are and how it can impact access to healthcare. I finally want to share some results that we found from a national survey uh, that we conducted. We conducted a national survey and we actually over uh, had oversampling of Latinas and Black women to get uh, an idea of how the public uh, views religious exemption laws. And what we found is good, good news, uh, in terms of the, the results showing that the majority of the public don't support religious exemption laws. We found 63% of voters oppose laws that allow hospitals to refuse to provide patients with care or information or referrals about abortion because of religious beliefs. 62% opposed laws that allowed insurance companies to refuse to cover abortion because of religious or moral beliefs. 62% opposed laws allowing doctors or nurses to refuse to provide a patient with information or referrals about abortion. And voters also on a positive note, really support proactive policies that ensure access to abortion. We found that 82% of voters support policies making sure that hospitals, nurses, and doctors provide patients with medical services, including abortions, particularly when a patient's life is at risk. 80%, and these are, are, are pretty large majorities, supported policies making sure that a hospital, even if the hospital does not provide abortion, still provides a patient with correct and complete information and referrals for abortion. So these survey results show strong public support uh, for ensuring access to care. And it also, our survey also showed that voters are willing to hold elected officials accountable uh, and are more likely to support officials who oppose religious exemption laws. So this is something that should be uh, encouraging. And one thing about discrimination, and, and I think it was surprising that a, in a lot of this political rhetoric, we saw folks raising up this, this uh, uh, idea that uh, certain religions were being discriminated against. Uh, just because folks want access to the care that they need. I think it's important that we talk that we talk about in our dialogue, uh, particularly as advocates, the need to take back what discrimination truly means. And I've shared these stories with you, and I think they all exemplify what discrimination looks like and the harm that's posed to patients. Uh, so we have to reclaim when we're talking about discrimination, we must reclaim what that really means and the real harm uh, that's posed to patients' health. Thank you. And I know that Kira Shepard with the Public Rights Private Conscience Project will be our next presenter. Thank you. Um... Janelle, I'm just trying to get my slides up right now. One second. One thing I want to say here while you're pulling up your slides is I saw a question about single payer. I'm sure folks heard that Senator Sanders introduced his single payer bill. Uh, today, it's my understanding that that bill would uh, create universal health care coverage, including access to comprehensive uh, reproductive health care, including abortion, contraception, and other uh, reproductive health care services. Uh, so I hope that that addresses the question. Uh, we know that in this current political climate, it's pretty difficult to predict where that bill might go, <laughs> if anywhere. 
Uh, but I did want to flag that uh, in response to that question about single payer. Thank you. Just give me one second. I'm having trouble here. Kira, I have your slides um, up here if you um, you want me to advance them for you. Um, sure, you can go ahead and do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, my name is um, Kira Shepard. I'm a, a racial justice director at the Public Rights Private Conscious um, Project. We are a think tank at Columbia Law School, and we focus on religious exemption laws and um, their impact on the public. We focus on reframing the conversation around religious exemption laws using legal scholarship as well as policy um, advocacy and community organizing. So we also work with community-based organizations um, who are interested in working on the issue. I particularly focus on how religious exemption laws um, impact communities of color. So with that, with the next slide, I want to discuss how religious exemption laws we talk about them now and how they um, impact the LGBTQ community as well as people seeking reproductive um, freedom and access. But these laws have a long history. So religious objectors use religion to discriminate um, back in the 50s. And the group that they use religious exemptions or religious freedom laws to discriminate against were actually Black folks. So this takes us back to Brown, um, the Board of Education, where the Supreme Court desegregated public schools. Um, after this happened, a lot of white people were upset, and many white Christian families, especially those in the South, they wanted to resist compliance with these desegregation laws. So they um, established, found something called segregation academies. So these were private institutions that were able to skirt the, these um, desegregation laws because they were private and under Brown v. Um, Board, it pertained to um, public institutions. So for a long time, there were white only schools, Christian schools, and they said their religious freedom should allow them to have such schools. Um, all of this changed in the 60s and 70s after a series of Supreme Court decisions that declared racially discriminatory private schools ineligible for tax exempt status. Um, however, despite that pressure, um, a lot of schools still remained um, white only. One such school was Bob Jones University. Um, Bob Jones University was able to uphold its policy against interracial dating until early 1980s when um, they were taken to court and the Supreme Court said that indeed the government could withhold tax exempt status from um, schools that engaged in racial discrimination. Um, and then another interesting case involving a private entity that used religion, tried to use religion to discriminate, um, is Newman versus Piggy Park. So there is a picture of the owner of Piggy Park Enterprises, which was a um, drive-in barbecue chain owned by a Baptist who was the head of the National Association for the preservation of white people. Um, his name was um, Maurice um, Bezinger, and he refused to let black people eat at his restaurant. Um, a black couple brought a class action suit against him. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court thankfully said um, that they dismissed the case and said it was frivolous. But in that particular case, he argued that his religious beliefs compelled him to oppose any integration of races whatsoever. So, I mean, I think it's interesting to look at this history and look at where we are now, where um, religious objectors are using religion to deny um, 
reproductive health care to women um, and people seeking that care, and also to the LGBTQ community. Um, and with the LGBTQ community, we see similar, similarly as to the Black community, they're doing this because they see this community as an other, um, and they're basically trying to use their, their um, religion, and they are using their religion, to discriminate and harm um, these communities. So if we go to the next slide, um, Janelle talked a little bit about the church amendment. So before the recent wave of religious exemptions law that we saw after a, the Burgerfeld decision, after same-sex marriage was legalized, and then after all of the pushback against the um, Affordable Care Act contraceptive amendment, way before that in the 70s, there was like a similar backlash against Roe v. v. Wade. And that's where we got the, um, the church amendment. So after Roe v. Wade, when abortion was legalized, a number of states and the federal government enacted medical conscious clauses. Janelle talked a little bit about that, um, providing a lot about that actually, providing abortion related exemptions for healthcare workers. So one such um, act was the Church Amendment, which states that healthcare entities receiving federal funds may refuse to provide abortion or sterilization if such services are contrary to their religious or moral beliefs. Um, after the church amendment was passed, a number of states filed suit, um, filed similar, passed similar laws. And in addition to these um, abortion conscious clauses, there were also pharmacists that were able to um, refuse to fill out prescriptions for birth controls under right to refuse um, refusal laws. So this was like the wave in the early um, 70s. And then after that, um, as we go on to the next slide, as I mentioned, two big, two big things happened that caused us to be where we are right now um, with the religious exemption laws. And that was the Burgerfeld decision and the Affordable Care Act. Um, and then we'll go to the next slide. So uh, one law that was passed well, that was proposed recently by the federal government was the First Amendment Defense Act. Um, this act, known as FADA, allows religious objectors to discriminate against those who have sex outside of marriage. And it's interesting because there was a lot of media hoopla about the law in 2015 when it was first proposed, and they discussed how the law would allow discrimination against people of same-sex and same-sex marriages, but it also allow people, a discrimination in people um, who have sex outside of marriage. So that's when these laws impact, um, could potentially harm and impact people of color. FADA was proposed. Trump, when, um, when he was campaigning, he said if it came across his desk, he would sign it. A number of states has proposed um, laws similar to FADA. Um, while FADA would, harm a lot of people in the population because a lot of people have sex outside of marriage. Um, one sure group that it would harm would be um, pregnant, single pregnant people and single parents. And this is because one surefire way to, to determine if someone has had sex outside of marriage is if they're single and they're pregnant or if they're single and they have a child. So therefore the law um, stands to disproportionately harm Black and Latino people um, for a number of social, economic, and cultural reasons out of all racial groups, particularly Black, but as, um, Latino people as well have the highest rate of children born outside of marriage. Um, in addition, Black and Latino women um, face higher rates of pregnancy discrimination in the work um, workforce already. So this type of law would compound and exacerbate the discrimination and trauma um, that these people already face. Um, as we proceed to the next slide, you would see the language in FADA. Um, it says the federal government shall not take away any discriminatory, discriminatory action against a person wholly or partially on the basis that such person believes or acts in accordance with a religious belief or moral conviction that marriage is or should be recognized as 
the union of one man and one woman, or that sexual relations are properly reserved to such a marriage. The way that FADA works is that it prevents the federal government from penalizing or um, fining anyone who discriminates a person who has sex outside of marriage. So for instance, under the law, a landlord who refused to rent to an unwed pregnant woman without they could do that without fear of being penalized or investigated um, under the Fair Housing Act. Or an employer who denied um, an unwed mother maternity leave in violation of the Family Medical Leave Act, they could do so without fear of enforcement actions by the Department of Labor. So this, these laws could um, lead to widespread discrimination. And like I said, they would harm and, and fall on people of color largely. Um, as we go to the next slide, we would, um, I wanna discuss the presidential executive order promoting free speech and religious liberty. So in May, Trump si um, signed a religious liberty executive order. Um, right before the order came out, a lot of people in the reproductive um, justice and LGBT Q rights community. We, we knew we heard the the order was coming out, and we thought it would call for call for widespread discrimination. The law came out, and it wasn't as bad as people thought it would be. Well, the order came out rather, and it wasn't as bad as people thought it would be. But there were two provisions in the order that caused a lot of concern for advocates. Um, one was um, section three in the order that said that the administration was considering, and Janelle mentioned this as well, amending the um, Affordable Care Act Preventative Care Amendment um, that has the birth control benefit or the, the contraceptive mandate. And then there was another section in the order that stated that um, Jeff Sessions, our attorney general, would issue guidance to federal agencies interpreting religious liberty protections in federal law. So many people weren't really sure what Section 4 meant exactly, but then two months ago, um, Jeff Sessions was speaking to a group called Alliance Defending Freedom, which is an anti-LGBTQ LGBTQ group, um, a group that the Southern Poverty Law Center has classified as a hate group. Um, and he stated that the Justice Department is planning to issue this guidance very soon. And he stated that the guidance would allow federal um, agencies to follow the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act. And as you see in the next slide, um, the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act is an act that was passed in um, 1993. It provides religious objectors with very broad protections. So basically Sessions is saying that um, he is going to instruct agencies to um, to issue laws under this particular act. Um, the act says that the government cannot substantially burden a person's exercise of religion unless that burden is necessary to fulfill a compelling government interest. Um, many advocates fear that this guidance will allow federal agencies to condone discrimination done in the name of religious beliefs in ways that we have never seen before. We're waiting for him to actually issue the guidance. We think the, issue, the guidance will be issued um, very soon. Um, and as we proceed in the next slide. And Janelle talked about this a little bit before. I'm just gonna um, um, dig into it a little deeper. In the, um, the EO, they mentioned that the government will be issuing a regulation amending the Affordable Care Act's birth control benefit. Um, this particular benefit has been fought by religious sectors for a very long time. And it was done so in 2014 with the Hobby Lobby um, decision. As we proceed to the next slide, we know that it was um, fought with the Zubik decision. Um, it went all the way to the Supreme Court, large religious nonprofits who under the um, Affordable Care Act contraceptive mandate 
they were given accommodation, which basically said instead of paying for contraceptive coverage themselves, the company could fill out a ejection form and then the insurance company would then have to pay for the birth control. Um, but with Zubik, a lot of these, a lot of religious nonprofits, they totally eject, objected to even filling out the form that said that it had to go to the insurance company um, to pay for the birth control. So the case went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided to punt the case back to the lower courts. Um, so then with that, everyone wanted to see what the decision would be around, have been waiting to see what the decision would be around um, Zubik. But one thing that we know is going to happen soon that's going to end all the debate around Zubik and the accommodation and the Affordable Care Act um, contraceptive mandate is the issuance of this guidance from the um, from the Department of Justice. Um, there were in May there was a leaked draft of this regulation, and if the actual regulation looks anything like the leaked draft, the situation is pretty dire. Um, the leaked regulation effectively overhauled the birth control benefit, broadening, broadening the type of company and organization that could request an exemption. This type of regulation will lead to many women who currently receive no-cost contraception having to pay out of pocket for medication, placing a significant burden on women of color and low-income women. So in um, 2013 alone, women saved one point for $1 billion dollars in out-of-pocket costs for birth control, and this was largely because of the mandate. Um, the teenage pregnancy rate has been um, dropping for a, 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 over the last decade, but it, it definitely has dropped substantially under the mandate, and that's because the mandate calls for education and um, for family planning, and it made sure that women um, were provided with contraceptive care. The regulation benefited a lot of women of color and teens of color because of the highest pregnancy rates are amongst um, adolescent teens of color. Um, as we proceed to the next slide, in the next slide, um, one thing that Janelle mentioned was um, Catholic hospitals. So Catholic hospitals, they fall under something called the Ethical Religious Directives, which are a set of um, guidelines which prohibit um, Catholic hospitals from doing abortions, um, in, um, in vitro fertilization, sterilization, contraception. So these laws, and actually our um, organization is doing a report about how, how Catholic hospitals um, impact women of color. So these laws, and we actually, um, we work with a social science group that found that a lot of Catholic hospitals are in areas where, which are um, disproportionately um, women of color live in these areas. One such case, and Janelle mentioned this, was Tamisha Means. Her case was taken by the ACLU, um, and the district court decided to dismiss her case because they said that they didn't have jurisdiction to hear the case. She also, under the ACLU, she, she filed a negligence claim saying that the Catholic hospital acted negligently by following these directives. Um, she also said that it was negligent for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops to, to issue the directives. Um, the court said that her negligent claims, um, they dismissed it because they said that the hospital had no duty to notify the, her of the policies. Um, they also said that they couldn't even touch the case um, around whether the United States um, Conference of Catholic Bishops um, ethical religious directives were wrong or right, or if they um, were negligent in um, in writing those directives, considering their impact on patients, because they said there was something called church autonomy, which meant that um, they couldn't even 
discuss the issue because it was an inter because it is an inter church conflict. Um, Tamisha Means and the ACLU decided to appeal the decision. And when they appealed the decision, the um, appellate court reaffirmed what the district court said, but they also said that she couldn't um, file a negligence claim, dismiss a negligence claim, because she did not experience any physical injury. And as Janelle mentioned, um, she was in a lot of pain, um, mental trauma and also physical trauma, because she went to the she went to her hospital, a Catholic hospital, one of the only Catholic hospitals in her area, a number of different times, um, and asked and, and tried to get some help and some relief for the pain. But they decided to send her home a number of different times, knowing that she needed care. But because the only real, the best way to, to remedy the pain that she was in was to abort the fetus. And they didn't want to do that, but they didn't tell her that that was their policy, that they didn't abort fetuses. They just kept sending her home with aspirin. Um, and a lot of people talk about the Tamisha Means case, but I, I quickly want to say that um, with the work that I do, I talk to a lot of people in the reproductive justice field, a lot of people, women leading um, a reproductive justice organization down south, um, organizations led by women of color who also work with low income women. And I hear, and I've heard um, two stories, and I was having a casual conversation with a woman, and she told me when she was 18, a similar thing happened to her when she was at um, a Catholic hospital. When she was 18 years old, she was uninsured. Um, she had a um, um, she was having complications. She had an infection. The hospital sent her home twice. They didn't tell her that the reason they were sending her home was because of these directives. They didn't refer her to another hospital. They just kept sending her home. She ended up um, miscarrying in her bathroom, um, bleeding, sopping up the blood with with diapers. Um, one interesting, or one of the reasons I'm interested in this work is because I think that the ethical religious directors are horrible, period, because they allow um, health care providers to discriminate and refuse um, care to women. But I also think the issue is compounded and exacerbated when um, women of color, particularly Black and Latino women, um, are allowed to be discriminated against under these directives particularly because we know that there's a lot of racial bias in the healthcare system already. So like for instance, a, a case like Tamisha Means where they just gave her aspirin and sent her away. Well, it's been well documented and researched that um, women of, um, that healthcare providers believe that black women are able to withstand more pain. So, in a case like Tamisha Means, or even in the case of the woman who was 18, they turned her away. I mean, those these type of biases could be the reason, and then they're allowed to do it because of their directive. These type of biases could be the reason that um, healthcare providers turn women away with just aspirin when they're in excruciating pain. And these directors, directives allow these providers to do that. Um, and, and then we also know that there are other issues affecting women of color. Um, women of color are disproportionately uninsured. So if you're uninsured, um, Black and Latino women are disproportionately under, um, underinsured. So if you're uninsured, you're not allowed to get um, proper prenatal health care. You're not, you're not, you can't not allow, you can't get proper prenatal health care. You can't get proper health care. So when you're pregnant um, and you are having a child and you deliver your baby at a hospital, there's a higher likelihood that you're gonna come into the delivery war or you're gonna be facing these doctors such as Tamisha Means had to um, with these type of complications. And there's a higher likelihood um, that you might miscarry. Um, so, and the woman I talked about before in Indiana, she was uninsured, um, uninsured and she was low income. So these um, particular directives um, are likely to cause women of color a greater amount of harm. So they're definitely something that people need to be trying to fight back against and definitely something to have on um, their radar. And thank you. Sorry about the um, technical difference, the difficulties. I thought I was all ready to go, but um, thank you. And I'm done. Great, thank you. Um... Kira and Janelle for those wonderful presentations. 
I want to um, be cognizant of time. So I, some people have already sent in questions. So I think I'm going to go ahead and just um, start out with the one with one question that I thought uh, I think that that at least I was really interested in hearing the answer to, and that's what you you have both provided a lot of information, and this has been really um, frustrating for me on my end listening to all of this, and it it raises the question of what can we have law students and we have advocates in the audience. What what would you say is like the one thing people should be watching out for that they should be prepared to do or steps they can take to try to fight back against these religious um, refusals? Well, this is Janelle. One thing I would definitely say is tell your story if you experience uh, barriers to access to care as a result of religious refusals or religious exemption laws, definitely speak up about it. Uh, that way we can elevate these stories that make it very real for uh, policymakers and other folks and hold your elected officials accountable. Accountable not only for opposing and help working to eliminate these kind of laws, but also proposing proactive legislation to ensure access to health care for everyone and to ensure that patients' uh, needs and patients' particular health uh, priorities and circumstances are taken into account uh, and not uh, religious belief. Yeah, and I, I want to um, add to that as far as Catholic hospitals, a group that's been doing a, a really good job with fighting back against um, Catholic hospital mergers, which have been rising in recent years, um, is a group called Merger Watch. So, um, so if someone hears that there might be a Catholic hospital merger in their neighborhood, then they can contact a group like Merger Watch. Some of the things that Merger Watch has done has been to work with um, citizens to inform other citizens in the areas about recently um, a hospital proposals, merged hospital proposals, so they can institute um, town halls to talk to other community members about the issues. Um, concerned community groups can write letters to the hospital board stating their concern about the fact that um, people will be denied services um, at these hospitals. And you can also work with elected officials. I, I think a merger watch has been successful and reaching out to state attorney generals about the issue and having them looking to the issue of um, Catholic hospitals and how they're allowed to withhold care. And then of course, there's legislation. And one thing that we want to do once, so we're working on this um, report about Catholic hospitals and how they disproportionately impact women of color. And, and one thing I, I would love to do with the rollout is really go into the states where women are being disproportionately impacted and educating people about what's happening. Because a lot of people, as, he's, as we try to um, explain with these stories, a lot of women or a lot of people who are turned away from these um, religiously affiliated hospitals, they don't even know why, they don't even know what's happening to them. Um, so first thing is to educate people about what's happening but then work with state legislators to pass legislation that would prevent um, these hospitals from denying service. So in New Mexico, this, um, the state center in New Mexico actually introduced a bill that would repeal um, New Mexico state exemption, exemption law. And it would, it would call on um, healthcare providers and institutions not to be able to um, refuse people based on moral or religious beliefs. So there's probably, of course, going to get a lot of pushback for that type of legislation, but those are, more people need to start talking about the need for this type of legislation and push their elected officials to at least to try to propose such legislation. Great, thank you. Um, I want to just squeeze in one or two quick last questions. And the first one that's just really related to that is how many Catholic hospitals are there in the nation? Um, so. There, um, so Merger Watch, once again, has done um, a great job of documenting um, how many Catholic hospitals, Catholic-sponsored or affiliated hospitals um, follow the ethical and religious directors. So there's over 500 
um, Catholic hospitals. Um, today, one in every six hospital beds are in, in the country um, is in a Catholic hospital system. So that's that's a lot. Um, over the last 10 years, the number of Catholic hospitals have increased by 16%, while the number of nonprofit hospitals and publicly um, owned hospitals have actually declined in numbers, which is scary. Um, and Catholic hospitals are merging more and more, and they're, they're merging for um, economic reasons. Um, Hospitals are incentivized to merge because um, mergers allow them to have a greater share of the local market, which strengthens their abilities to negotiate with insurers. So um, we're going to be seeing more and more mergers in the future, and that's why I'm urging everyone to um, to look out for it. Okay, thanks. Um, and then our final question before we have to um, say goodbye it's just we've had several, we have a few questions from medical professionals and specifically you know how can medical professionals work to carry out uh, reproductive justice in their practice one this is Janelle one thing I would definitely say is uh, speak up join associations whether it's a medical students association I mentioned ACOG the American uh, College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the stance that they have taken, uh, just joining groups to, of, of providers to raise visibility, to speak out. Uh, and we uh, actually have uh, a staffer here who is focused on ensuring the providers are not subject to retaliation mm -hmm. for the care that they provide, uh, particularly for abortion care. So definitely, I would say speaking up, providing the care that you know a patient needs, uh, sharing stories. Some of the stories that I shared actually come from providers. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you both so much. Um, as a reminder, we are recording today's webinar, and we will send the webinar recording and slides to everyone with the next few days. Um, if you have some additional specific questions that were not answered, we can also send those answers out either to everyone or specifically to you, so feel free to email us. You have our contact information. Um, in addition, we can we will send out materials in addition to the slides. We can send out other materials, fact sheets, um, and so uh, feel free to reach out to us if there are any kind of specific questions you have, and we can make sure to try to include those materials. Yamhi, is there anything else in the housekeeping front? Nope, just a reminder um, that we will be sending uh, re the recording and slides within the next few days, but that's it. All right, great. Thanks to everyone, and thank you, Akira and Janelle, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you.